Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the magnificent Kat Lowe. Kat has a wealth of experience conducting practical research, collaborative research as she calls it in the field and she gives some really useful practical advice um, and also thinking particularly about the the moment we find ourselves in now with the challenges of COVID. But she also talks more generally around the ethics of practice, um, talking about the importance of setting up space, safe spaces, about the importance of conversation and reflection. And my own favourite phrase, creating a network of care. Love it. Um, So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Kat. Hi. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's lovely to um, have a conversation with you because we've known each other for a while, haven't we? We've kind of been in the same sort of orbit. And I have loved your work. I love how you approach your work. And I've always been just so impressed with the the field work that you do the commitment to that field work the international scope of that um so I am so pleased that you said yes that you'd come and share your thoughts and advice on field work well thanks Emma that's the most delightful introduction and invitation ever I mean and right back at you because um your generosity and thought and careful consideration and just ability to summarize things in a the most elegant way possible eloquent and elegant is yeah so it's to delight so thank you for this bless you how lovely is that um so we are going to talk um about fieldwork but first of all what I always ask people is to say a little bit about their experience of doing a PhD and how you got to the place you got now. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, of course. Um, So I was thinking a bit about this and um, so PhD research and just generally research, I think for me, it's been so integrally part of who I am, because I think our practice or my practice particularly is really about um, practice research and the way to to not make work about certain things feels, it comes naturally, so to not do it feels unnatural. And I I fell into studies, Um, I fell into higher education and research um, in the sense, well, not really. I mean, I went to university, but I hadn't planned to go to university. Um, And, but I'd been always I'd always done theatre work and theatre work with different what we might now describe as applied practice, um, just generally more sort of socially engaged theatre making where I was growing up in Switzerland. Um, and then uh, when I was at the University of Glasgow, I got an opportunity to work what feels like what is back home in South Africa in Limpopo province, um, which is a rural part. It's of South Africa with a a long history of a lot of neglect under apartheid and from there and I think that's the opportunity where I really got went oh there's something really exciting that could happen here in terms of making theatre around social issues and for me particularly it was about health and it's always been about health and in uh, most recently really about sexual health Um, and I think a lot of that's come from I've had a hugely privileged upbringing. I'm a South African Swiss woman. I'm white and I've grown up in Switzerland and then I've had the opportunity to come to the UK and study in the UK and then end up teaching at a UK university, which was not on my agenda at all, but it's a wonderful uh, plan. Um, And the work I started doing in South Africa was really in response to, um, at the time, Tabo and Becky's denialism of the link between HIV and AIDS and just watching Mm. this this president, which we now see there are a variety of reasons for his denial 
of that. But like we see this now in politics today. I mean, Trump is an example of just like the rhetoric that comes out and the impact that that has on the everyday person. And so I worked with this group of young people in a high school in um, in Sabasa. And we talked about sex in a variety of different ways. And actually, fundamentally, my practice has been how do we set up spaces in which to talk about what feels right for you sexually, what feels safe for you sexually, how do we even start a conversation about sex? Um, so I got into talking about sexual health through theatre in 2003 and have been doing it pretty much <laughs> ever since in a variety of different ways. Um, I felt, I, yeah, it was also for me an opportunity to to travel back to South Africa as well um, and to work in South Africa um, and see my family. So that's been one of the huge joys of field work for me mm. is really this opportunity uh, to, to connect between the different parts of my life, the UK, Switzerland and South Africa and how they all link up. Um, and I ended up fundamentally... <sighs> I think I also got an opportunity to work in Tanzania um, in 2006 and 2007, researching theatre for development projects that worked around sexual health work and looking at their practices and documenting their practices. Um, and there was something often awry with, especially in South Africa, between the, um, the lacked spaces for, for conversations to happen. People were told information, especially young people were told information in a particular way and then kind of told to get on with it. And it's actually, I mean, talking about sex is highly, I mean, yes. I, don't have, I don't have a teenager. <laughs> but like, um, I happily talk about sex and we'll talk about sex to anyone, but other people, like mm. it's a complicated topic. Um, mm. And like, and it's um, Peter Dirk Ace, who is the most amazing human being in South Africa. He's a, you must look up Peter Dirk Ace. I'll send some links. And he ran a free educational um, show for South Africa, um, sex education show. But it's basically sex is com comedic. And how do we work around that? Um, so how do we create spaces and conversations where young people can actually just start a conversation? So that's been my drive. In, and that's how I ended up uh, looking at socially engaged practice. <laughs> and how I fell into my field work. Field work. <laughs> Brilliant. And so that you kind of, you came through that study and then um, I think because people are always interested in, in terms of how people have got their current job. So that there was a kind of, oh, there's of a sense of you working through your, um, your research, your PhD, and then got a job after that. Yeah. So I, um, I studied at Glasgow and then I went to Manchester and I did a, an MA at Manchester and then did my PhD at Manchester with um, the amazing uh, James Thompson, Jenny Hughes and Maya Green. And through actually through all of my, once I graduated from Glasgow, I, I've taught alongside. So I've been a visiting lecturer in various different institutions. Um, and then I hilariously had my Viva and my, my job interview for Central in the same week, what? which was great fun. <laughs> my external examiner also happened to be on my interview panel. <laughs> so it was like, hi, see you twice. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting week. So I could talk a lot about Viva preparation wow. and how not to do it. <laughs> um, but so, uh, yes, yeah, so I handed in my PhD in, um, I think, s September 2010, I think. And then, yeah, and then started teaching at Central in the January 2011 and then also at Goldsmiths. I worked between two different institutions for a while um, and then got a full-time post at Central where I've been, yeah, actually, you know what? This is my 10th year at Central. No, it isn't. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's Which is ridiculous. hilarious for me because this is the longest I've ever been anywhere. Um, the house that I'm in at the moment is the longest I've ever lived anywhere up until about eight years ago I moved every two years so this feels wow. very very permanent <laughs> I can't believe that you've been there so long but the, but yeah. the, the, but I suppose I mean, your practice is always evolving so I think it's like that you've been there but things have certainly changed since yeah. you started there in your work amazing. Yeah. amazing thank you for that thank you so much for that and I think there's some really interesting stuff come up from that in terms of um about contextualization for your work I know is really important um setting up spaces I think that is key and a conversation um and 
this, this sense of that being central to, to field work in terms of space to work and how you negotiate that, how you set that up. Um, and I know that now not only have, do you do your own field work, you supervise students doing their field work. Yeah. So let's get into that then in terms of your experiences of field work or your advice for field, for field work. We were thinking of like the mm. sort of the pros and cons. So your thoughts on that, please. Okay. <laughs> so um, field work, or I, I think I wouldn't describe it as I've got, I, we re- rename it practice, but right. um, no, but that's that's fine. It's more like actually the pro is the privilege to spend time with people, and mm. this privilege to spend time to sit and think and make and adapt um, to sit with the materials and really set up a space for exploration. So a lot of the way we work, we talk about our practice is very much about co-collaborative research so um, the young people or the women I end up working with they are the co-researchers um, I have a general theme uh, which is a proposal of what the project might look like but fundamentally if you know if they choose to focus on something else well you know what that's what we'll look at you know so how do we so it's always about negotiation um, and it's about setting up trust and finding ways of working and I think part of that is is about hon- honesty in the sense it's like there's there's it's important obviously in terms of safeguarding and vulnerabilities and working around that but I think what I've become really conscious of over the past or t- I mean I've just pu- finished I've just published my book which is um on my PhD research which is like 10 years later which is um and I've spent a lot of time sitting and thinking about why why was that piece of practice so important um and it is fundamentally that space to sit and think and to be honest and talk openly um and I think also at the time of the practice I was the same age as the people that I was working with so we were learning together in a particular way especially um, especially when we when you start talking about sex and how do you negotiate what safe sex for you so there's a sense of 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 a privilege of time and space for exploration that people have time and give you the time and that it's um it's a mutual and I suppose remembering and acknowledging the mutual benefits you get out of it and actually really acknowledging your what you get out of it mm. I mean I'm really conscious that as a result of this PhD practice I have a book I have a job I have a reputation, good or bad, who knows, don't answer that one. Very good, about, no, it's very good. <laughs> about the way we work. And actually I've, so I'm really consciously always thinking and part of it. And actually I think that's where I really think about the pros of practice uh, or the opportunity to do extended field work is that you get to build relationships. So of the of the 30 odd people I worked with in 2008, I managed to, um, meet up with them again in 2009 um, about so 30 people join so, well anyhow I managed to meet up with about half of them and then over the years I'm still in contact with maybe about a third of oh, the participants which is and that's where technology has come and helped which is I'm going to come to in a bit in terms of how do we work for, forward but when I started in 2008 there so much has changed in terms of technology we didn't people people didn't have email accounts um some couple of people had mobile phones but not really people's mobile numbers change a lot but now with whatsapp with facebook which is not my (laughs) not my natural working ground but (laughs) whatsapp you know so there's been a sense of communication and actually joyfully i hadn't a text from one of one of the women who texted me just um just before christmas to say that she's she's starting in january she's starting her university degree in january in music in cape town and it's just like how awesome is that and actually and i think that's where the pros of field work or the pros of practice is that you get so the i've been back to meet with um whoever i can get hold of when i'm back in cape town so i've seen people in 2014 and then 2017 and we've done follow-up interviews and talked and just talked about the practice but also we've grown up together and we the 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 practice has developed beyond like me coming in as a facilitator like we'll send pictures of each other's kids you know see a bongo became a dad so you know all of these really exciting life moments have come and that's been a real pro I think the con thinking about that is the juggling of multiple competing factors and I think when you're in the throes of field work um 
you often feel like you're wanting to do more and you're being torn between different spaces. And I think um, support is really vital in terms of when you're when you're on in the middle of your your field work is like what does support look like for you? Mm. And how do you keep um, how do you keep going there? Um, and what yes. structures you might put in place for you? Yes, and because I think what you're what you're talking about in terms of that negotiation that relationship with real live human beings which of course has the gorgeous messiness to that Mm. in terms of how you negotiate that the ethics of that um it's it's has that fantastic sense of opportunity but also as you say that sense of your own vulnerabilities your own limitations so what sort of support um would you recommend for people so um i so i would um be out and so i had the opportunity to, i worked in south africa in tanzania for big chunks of time and i worked and i think the the point of it was i didn't work alone and that was really fundamental is like i was really conscious that i would be working with young people in the country when i knew i'd be going back to the uk to kind of write up or to think so always to work in partnership if you're able to. So I worked with two awesome local grassroots organizations who are still there. Fundamentally, my PhD then became really about South Africa. Um, It was, there was just too much to say. Um, So building really strong working relationships with the people you're collaborating with, not just the host organization or finding a host that felt really important for the practice is to find someone where people could still come to, even if I wasn't in the country that felt the right thing to do ethically um but then also support for you as um as a researcher so my supervisor and I agreed a weekly check-in um where I would write logs and talk through and like actually and that's one of my top tips is thinking about writing a log and writing a log book or um I have a particular structure which I'm happy to share which, amazing um with field work it's just kind of like what stood out um, what didn't work and why. And it's always been about that gut reaction. I mean, that's my top tip is like when you go into a room or you're doing something and your gut is saying, yeah, not sure about that. Why is what's happened there? Because that's where the biggest learning will be for you as a practitioner, as a researcher, as a facilitator, but also kind of going, actually, if I'm holding the room in this way, if I'm feeling like this, what's happening? You know, so those moments mm. of Mm. so really to strongly and actually that's when you can sit um and write back so I know I'm jumping ahead in terms of top tips but document your work document Mm. your work in any shape that feels good for you so um I discovered I was dyslexic once I came to start teaching at Central so that's a whole other conversation to do but like actually being neurodivergent I realized offers so many other brilliant amazing creative and messy possibilities but um now in 2020 one, <laughs> 2021 mm, 21. We, we have um amazing technology and i am the least technological person you will ever meet but things like dragon which is like a dictate um, talk to speak talk to computer it writes it out for you stuff um in terms of taking logs would revolutionize this. Um, I knew that I would run workshops or like have a session which would be three hours long and then probably spend four hours writing it up. Mm. But now you can talk to speak, you know, you can, so that, um, because if you document, you know, my notes from 10 years ago are like, I think I've got 200,000 words worth of notes, you know, it's just, it's amazing as a resource. Yes. Um, yes. But also share your documentation. So, and again, which is so much more possible now, is that I wasn't the only person documenting our practice. Everyone in the room was documenting the practice. So like, think about multiple different ways of documenting because A, it takes the pressure off you and also you'll be introduced to other ideas or things you might not have seen. And mm. that's so important for doing practice-based research is that, especially with, with people, um, with co-collaborative researchers, you can really go, oh, Babalua thought about it that way and Nandamisa was thinking about it that way. That's really interesting. You know, so that's, I think, really important. Um, And that brings so much richness into your work in terms of the way that you let 
let let is not the word is it that you um encourage those other voices to come through um and it yeah just does yeah. beautiful things I think I mean the thing I think it comes back to like it's collaborative research without the people I worked with there would be no research and there yeah. would be no documentation of the practice and I think that's what that's what feels the most ethical, but also the right thing to do. It's like, and it's so much more interesting to hear about what Moxie has to say versus, yeah. you, know, you know, than this person's view. Um, and I think I mean, it can be, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I think it can be difficult as a PhD student because you can feel like you have to have all the answers and you, you have yeah. to come in and, and offer the 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 reflection and the but that you said something really important about holding a space that that's what you're doing you're holding a space and you're facilitating conversation and that's that is the PhD research isn't it that's the yeah work. yeah because you yeah exactly um and I think the thing about practice or field work is that it doesn't finish um, and it will never finish. So you need to pull it. You need to draw a line. End of 2009, that's when, I'm, you know, whatever it happens to be. But also to acknowledge that it will still come into your everyday life. And I think that's really important because you're acknowledging the wholeness of you as you're not a PhD, just a PhD researcher. You're a PhD researcher and a sibling or um, a child or a mother or a carer. You know, there's the multiple possibilities of you are held in that space and I think if we start to divvy up and go this is just me being the PhD researcher this is me just being the lecturer that do- it doesn't work for me mm. um, and I think that's really important and actually I think that kind of allows the messiness of research to really thrive the fact that I have we have this sort of network of care um, you know that Amanda sends me a message of the 1st of January every year to go happy new year what's in store you know there's a check that's a lovely sort of that's a value and I think especially in applied or socially engaged practice we talk so much about the values and the outputs and it's like actually for us to start thinking really carefully about the ephemeral values the tangible values the affective values that have huge resonances and are deeply important um, and are more important than going 72 percent of the people are now wearing condom you know all of that bot yeah. stuff <laughs> rubbish network um, of care yeah. I love it network yeah. of care that's a gorgeous phrase gorgeous yeah. and it's that's really important for 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 my practice um I've been thinking about what do you do now in terms of practice or field work under COVID and I'm saying that what I'm going to say I'm prefacing or putting a caveat is that I am not a digital native and I am I am I'm the last person you'd come to to ask them how to use a camera or something like that. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not I'm not a, a joyfully technical person and I still look quite vague with Zoom and things like that. But the digital has been revolutionary. So this year we've run um, remotely two projects in South Africa. One, um, actually three projects in South Africa. Uh, two in one in Hillbrow and then two in rural part of South Africa in the, in the Western and the Northern Cape. Um, and one of them has been a sustained project with a, a group of women that I was supposed to be with in May, but obviously that didn't happen. Um, and we've done weekly workshops up between, between May and December. We did weekly check workshops. We, I ran workshops remotely um, and then they also worked together and I think the fact that this practice wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been able to embrace the digital. And like when I say embrace the digital, we were working in a room that had no Wi-Fi. There's only one phone, you know, so WhatsApp has been really important. So actually, I've learned so much about working collaboratively, remotely. Mm. And I think a huge amount is possible. Um, that we're just so we're doing digital storytelling and all sorts of things but a lot of that's based on the fact that I have really strong existing working relationships with co-researchers and participants in South Africa now the group of people we worked with the women we worked with um, in in the Durans in in May we'd never worked together so it was a new project but my the Erica Lattish who's the the, the other uh, artist researcher on the project she was based in South Africa so she was able to hold the room and I think this is the thing it's like I think one of my PhD candidates is is really struggling because their practice was actually everyone's practice was supposed to be in person 
Mm -hmm. um, and one is possible for them to kind of start doing it because they've they've thought carefully about the digital and have moved the practice online to the digital and actually works really well for their practice. But the other one was very much about it was just about to start and the organization they're working with, their funding's been cut now, you know, so there's just it's it's really hard. Um, I think if you don't have an existing structure or network, because there's so much, uh, there's so much important safeguarding, uh, ethics, digital access, um, how, how the participants, do they have equipment? You know, all of those really yes, important yes. questions. Um, so, for example, in South Africa, we, we bought mobile phones where appropriate or uh, we paid for um, data. Um, so people are, you know, so we were able to have WhatsApp right. groups. So there's so many other criteria for that. And I'm really happy to talk to people or share information further yeah. about that. But because um, I think what I keep saying to people is that sense of this is this is the this is the work. This is the chapter that you're writing. You're writing a chapter about how to research in a time of COVID. So that sense of that like you say in terms of finding new ways of working it will it will throw into relief things that you might have assumed um and you'll kind of go oh yeah actually that's really important I need to kind of document that and think about that so I, I suppose it's that sense of your your research project will still be continuing but it may look very different and it may throw up really different considerations and to embrace that, because actually research is responsive. You know, these are the circumstances in which you're working at the moment, and that's okay. Yeah. You know what? Because I think this is the other thing. The PhD is not the be-all and end-all, no. you know. It's just one major, major hurdle, which is enjoyable and engaging and challenging and absolutely brain-frying and then phoenix like you will emerge you know yeah. you do emerge it's a process like it has brought me so much and I've learned so much and it's and I think to not separate the PhD from who you are as a, as a whole being um, and it's just one small part of what you're doing at this point in time and it's just one small part of your whole human existence so oh, I love to be, that it's a small part to be kind that. Yeah, to be kind and caring to yourself, I think. And you will get through it, I promise. And I think what you said earlier about honesty too, I think in the, in kind of in terms of documenting this part of your process that you're in mm. at the moment and the challenges of COVID, your examiners will be interested to hear about that. What challenges came up for you? How did you negotiate that? What what learning were you drawing on? It's It's all part of it. It's all grist to the mill, isn't it? And part totally. of your human ex yeah. human ex I love this small part of your whole human existence um oh gosh there's so much in there Kat and thank you so much for offering to um for other for people to make contact for other information too because I, I you have a wealth of experience in this area and that I'm sure people will be grateful for that but I am going to finish as I always do asking the unfair question because you've already given us some top tips <laughs> but I'm going to ask if there is if there is a top tip that you would give in terms of field work practice um I think your plan until you're blue in the face um you'll you'll think about the documentation from every angle um just remember to stay open and it's the thing that I really realized that about the practice that we did together in South Africa in 2008 wasn't just about what was in the room, but it was the stuff that was happening around the sides, around the edges. And that's really what I'm, not to blatantly plug my book, but that's what I'm doing, <laughs> plugging my book, is that I talk about the idea of... It's brilliant. <laughs> thank you. It's about the idea of apertures of possibility. And it's to take a moment to think about the, the intangible, those glimmers of lights, the things that just happen on the margins, the stuff that happens on the margin, the conversation, the look, the touch, or the conversation that keeps coming back, those taking that opportunity to pause and to think and to kind of put a little frame about that funny thing that happened on the side, that's what you should keep being open to because I think that's where the real delightful, interesting 
things happen that are really of value, of affect, of importance. So to pause, um, to respond to your gut, to listen to your gut and to kind of go, oh, what was that just happening there on the side of my eye? That glimmer, what is that? And don't go for the obvious. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for encouraging us to pause and reflect. Um, thank you so much, Kat. And I will, as always, the references um, will be in the show notes um, so that people can follow those up. Um, and obviously Kat's contact details too. Um, and thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey. <laughs>